Hey y'all, I'm James Wright. Welcome to my shop. Today we're going to take a look at how do you sharpen molding planes or combination plane irons. Let's have some fun. So you just bought a set of combination cutters or you have a molding plane that you really want to get sharpened. But how in the world do you sharpen some of these weird faces? Cutters and molding planes come in all different shapes and sizes. It can get really confusing of, do I need a sharpener for every one of those? And really, we want to take all of this and break it down into its simplest forms. A lot of them are straight irons or they're skewed, and so you can sharpen these just like a chisel or a plane iron. Just set them down and sharpen them like normal. Some of them have a convex shape, and these ones you can sharpen just like a scrub plane. They're a little bit more difficult, but they work relatively well. Some of them have a concave shape, and this is where things start to get a little confusing of, ooh, oh no, how do I, how do I make that actually happen? And then some of them take it even farther and they'll have convex, concave, and flat surfaces on it. So let's actually go through these one at a time. So let's start off with this straight iron. It's gonna be just like a chisel. I'm gonna place it on there, lift it up until I set the bevel. Two fingers in the front, it's gonna be resting on these fingers in the back, and I'm just going to freehand it. If you haven't gotten into freehand sharpening, I have several videos on how to do it, and I say it's definitely worth your time. Once you can get freehand sharpening down, everything becomes much easier. After working it through the grits, we can work the burr off and strop it just like normal, and now we have an edge that is really ready to go. For the convex shape, things get a little bit more complicated. So I'm gonna put my Windex on here again. And for this, I'm gonna hold it the same way. Two fingers on top, three underneath. And I'm gonna start up in one corner, and I'm gonna push it away from me, and rock it up until I'm on the other corner. And I can come back and forth. And I'm not gonna do much. And then I'm gonna check it and make sure that I'm getting clean all the way across. Occasionally you'll see that you're hitting too much in the outside corners and not enough in the middle. And so that means you need to spend a little bit more time in the middle before bringing it back up. The other method is to start up here on one corner and then drag it back towards you. And at, by the time you get to the other end, you're on the other corner. So you're kind of making this cross pattern from one side to the other. There's the complicated pattern. If I can start on this corner, I'm gonna do circles. And as I do it, my wrist is gonna be slowly rotating from one side to the other. And this allows me to use the entire plate, and I can go from spot to spot, but this one takes the most skill and practice to do. Most of the time, my favorite is just rocking it from side to side, push and pull away from me, and work from one side of the plate to the other. The nice thing about learning different methods and trying different styles is I can make scratch patterns one direction on one plate, and then when I bring it over to the other pattern, I can have a different scratch pattern so I know when I've removed the scratch patterns from one to the other. After that, clean the burr, and then strop it out just like normal. With the stropping, you wanna take a little bit more time in that I'm gonna do one spot, I'm gonna do three or four drags, move it over three or four, do move it over three or four, move it over three or four, or I can do the same method of pulling away from me and rock it from one side to the other, um, whichever you are more comfortable with. I usually do three or four one spot and then slowly rotate my wrist until I'm up on the other side there. Now for this beading cutter, this one's a little bit different. This one actually has two flats and a concave surface. So you wanna make sure we're hitting both the flats and the concave surface. So we're gonna do this in two parts. I want to do the flats first. Now, one of the problems is I don't wanna overdo them. I don't wanna take those surfaces down so fast that I'm taking them down faster than the center point. So I'm not gonna do as much to them. And remember that they're very small pieces. So they don't take that much to do right. I'm just gonna do coarse, medium, fine, flip them over, move the burr, take it over to the strop, and a couple stops, a couple strops, and now those points, yeah, those points are ready to go. But what do I do with the inside? The inside doesn't exactly fit on a plate. I can't get that rounded surface in there. Sometimes I can use these DMT waves. You just find the spot that's the right radius and you just work that little spot just a little bit. But for something like this that's so deep, I generally don't like using the waves. The traditional method is to grab a slipstone and come in and just grind it down like this. Now remember, this may look like an oval, but it's actually a circular shape. This is a perfectly round shape. It's just at a 45 degree cutting angle. So my slipstone needs to be at 45 degrees and goes all the way up the side here and all the way up the side here. I'm not tipping it in or out on the sides. I'm just keeping this at 45 degrees as I slipstone this. 
But let's be honest, a good set of slip stones, they're expensive, they break easily, they're slow. I just really don't like using these that much. Not to mention finding the right profile can often be a pain. But there is something nice and almost nostalgic about using a slip stone. It just, it feels good. Most of the time what I'm gonna do is grab a dowel and some sandpaper. And I want a longer dowel so the dowel stays put and the iron moves along, just like I would with the sharpening stone. And the dowel just has to be a smaller diameter. If you find one that's the exact diameter, fantastic, but those are actually pretty rare. And I'm just gonna be doing this, I'll start with something around a 200 grit, and then I'll go up to a 400 grit, and sometimes I'll really take it wild and go up to a 1,000, but most of the time with these, I'm gonna stop somewhere around a 4 or a 600 grit. I find the sandpaper method to be much faster and more efficient and a little bit simpler as I'm moving the iron rather than moving the small slipstone. I can't really hold on to a small slipstone and move the iron past it. Then once I've done all the bevel, bring it back over here to my finest stone. I'm just gonna bend that burr back over on all those pieces. And then I'm gonna grab a loose strop and bring it over here. And I'm going to strop the inside of the burr and just bend it over to match the shape. That's the nice thing with a good hard horse butt is you can bend it to match just about any shape you want. And then polish off the back. And that, yeah, that's ready to go. That's, that's happy. But then what happens when we get to this little thing? This has a flat surface, a concave surface, a convex surface, another concave surface, and then another flat surface. How in the world do we do all of that? All we do is we break it down into each of its pieces and we do them one by one. So I'm gonna start with one flat surface. That one leans off the stone a little bit. I'm gonna work that flat surface. Then we come over here to the other flat surface. I'm gonna bring it over here, set it on the edge of the stone. And I'm gonna sharpen that one down. And remember, each one of these pieces are very, very small. They aren't gonna take much effort at all. They just take a little bit of movement and you can remove a decent amount of metal pretty quickly. For the first concave section, I'm just gonna do it on the dowel here like this and slowly go around. It doesn't gonna take much at all to bring that down and I've got a slight burr working up on the back. For this next convex section, I can't really fit that on the stone, and so I'm going to use that on the same dowel, but rather than staying in here, I'm just going to draw across it, just small sections, take your time. There really isn't a great fast way to do this. Everything about sharpening is patience. As I pull back along the sandpaper, you'll also see me move down as I go across this way. Again, just maintaining that 45 degree angle. For this small concave section, I'm just gonna grab a really small dowel, wrap the paper around there, and it's really not gonna take that much at all to go in here and sharpen it out just like everything else. Once all those features have been hit and we have a nice tiny slight burr all the way along it, I'm gonna bring it over here and flip that burr, and then we're gonna take it over to the strop. And for the strop, we're gonna do the same thing again. We got the flat sections, one section, and then another section, Another nice thing about that horse butt is it holds its shape really nicely. Bend it to that first concave and then work a little bit on that convex, just the exact same movement we had. For that tiny concave, I'm actually just going to use the edge of it and push it in and use that to get into the surface. Now, if you're finding that you're using this cutter a lot, you may actually want to cut a profile into the edge of a board and use that as your strop and you can put compound into that wood, as particularly if it's like MDF or pine, you can put compound on there and use that as a profiled strop to hit everything evenly. It's very rare that you're using one of these so often that you're having to sharpen it constantly. It's usually one of these things that you sharpen once every few years, if that. Most of these irons you're never gonna even use if you buy a full set of them, so it's not something you really need to worry that much about having an exact match to it. Just understand, it's gonna take a little bit of time, it's gonna take a little bit of practice, and It'll come out in the end. Now that's all well and good for these 45 and 50 Stanley cutters because they don't have a sole, you don't need to match anything perfectly. But if you are working with a molding plane and you need the iron to match the profile of the plane perfectly, then sometimes you have a little more issue. Now the nice thing with these is the iron can kind of move around and a lot of times you just don't have it positioned correctly. But in some cases you'll notice that there'll be a spot where you're taking a heavy shaving there and right next to it you're taking a really thin shaving. Uh, and so you may want to work with that and realize next time you sharpen it, the spot where you're taking a heavy shaving, you may want to sand that spot a little bit more to take off a little bit more material. But in one sharpening, you're not going to change the profile that much. 
just keep an eye on it from sharpening to sharpening and you'll notice that every time you pick it up you'll be like mm, yeah next time I need to work on something this spot or next time I need to go a little bit lighter on this spot and so you'll be working with the profile to match the plane it's very rare that they ever get so far out that they cause you a problem because sharpening doesn't take off that much metal it's just a tiny little bit and so you're only making slight adjustments from one to another especially when doing it all with hand tools now there are some people who used to sharpen these with power tools and then you're going to get into problems because then you can take off a lot of material and you're going to run into all sorts of issues and that's why it's just not worth sharpening these in power tools. A slipstone, sandpaper on a dowel, diamond plates, just simple things just to have a little bit of fun, take some time, some patience. You're not going to have to sharpen it all that often and just enjoy the process. So I hope this helped you out. Uh, it's one of those things that you don't really have to do that much unless you're doing a lot of profiles and then you'll find your own system that really works for you. But most people don't do it that often. It's something you do once a year or so and so you really don't have to work on it that much. But as long as you look at the profile and realize that it's just a bunch of little pieces and you sharpen each piece individually, you'll see that it's relatively simple. Don't take off much material, just enough to sharpen it and that's all you need to get going. Most of the time the steel on these is relatively soft and so they can be sharpened pretty easily. They're not something you really have to work on. And a lot of the old molding planes are very soft so they sharpen incredibly easy because you're not going to be using them that often. You don't have to worry about them getting dull so you only sharpen them when you're about to use them because you want to set up that plane for that particular task. Now if you do have any questions, thoughts, things I missed or things I could have done better, please let me know. I'd love to hear if you have some particular technique that you use because I really like seeing how different people do it and there's always new things to learn. I really enjoy that process and particularly when people put comments down below different things that I haven't seen before. I love that. I love learning from that and I read every one of the comments and answer as many of the questions I can get to and thank you. It really helps us out as well as hitting the like, share, subscribing. Really uh, that does help the engagement and helps us get in front of more people, helps everything grow and really means a lot. So if you want to help out with that then think about putting a comment down below and being one of those people. Thank you. <laughs> but if you want to go even farther, if you really want to be amazing, if you really want to be wonderful, think about joining these people over here. Those people are the patrons on Patreon. They are the ones who keep the lights on. Between patrons and members, you guys support us, you keep us going, and you are the reason we are here. Without patrons or members, people who click that thank you button, we wouldn't be here. So if you want to help out with that, you know what to do. I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Oh, no, I just realized that. My plane is molding.